Pop quiz! What's the first game series that you think of when you think of Nintendo? The correct answer is Chibi Robo. Anywho, The Legend of Zelda series is a close second for Nintendo in critical and commercial success. It's one of the original Nintendo series that's still kicking to this day. Millions of old and new Nintendo fans love the series for its creative worlds, mind-bending dungeons, and likable companion characters. Not to mention, the series probably had a hand in molding the open-world game genre that we know today. After all, the first game in the series is one of the first open-world games ever made, definitely the most successful of that decade. To celebrate this memorable game franchise for no other reason than my Mario video doing so good and, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, let's just say, I'll be taking a look at every single main series, Legend of Zelda game. As far as ground rules go, no spin-off games or games on the Philly CBY. With all that said, as Zelda would always say, let's -a go The original Legend of Zelda for the NES is often looked at as being cryptic and an overall poorly aged game, but I would beg to differ. The Legend of Zelda actually makes you think, and that's where most of the challenge lies. You see, in a quote-unquote challenging game like Celeste, all you really do is jump, and that's basically it. I could probably do this all in my sleep. An example of something challenging in Zelda is the one bush you have to burn down to access the secret cave. You might think it's tedious and cryptic as all get out, especially without a godforsaken guide, but it's more of a test of your knowledge than tedious. As I was playing, my thought process was, okay, so I need to burn down a bush. Is it this one? No, it wasn't that one. So I know not to burn down this bush. Is it this one? Nope, it wasn't that either. What about this one? Okay, so it wasn't that one either. Perhaps it's this one. Yes, it is! It was so rewarding finally finding the right bush. But this is the kind of stuff you just don't get with new games. It's great, and I'm giving the original game a 10 out of 10. Zelda 2 is kind of the black sheep of the Zelda series. For one thing, it's the only game in the series to be a 2D platformer instead of a top-down or 3D adventure game. Another thing people hate about this game is how hard it is, which I can agree with. This game is clearly way too hard for its own good, but that might just be my hatred for challenging games talking. Overall, I pretty much agree with what everybody says. This game isn't very good. Oh wait, now people are starting to like this game now, as it's, as it's gotten older. It only took like 32 years for people to realize that. In that case, 8 out of 10. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is the first of many Zelda games to be considered by many to be the greatest game of all time. And I can see where they're coming from, because everything in A Link to the Past holds up. The graphics have aged very well in particular, which you can probably thank all the indie games with pixel art style graphics for. This is also the first Zelda game to have an exceptional soundtrack too. I think the only really memorable songs from the first two games are the main theme and the palace theme from 2 that they remixed for Smash Bros. Melee. In Latitapa, which is what I'm going to be calling A Link to the Past from now on because it sounds funny, there's the new main theme, Kakariko Village, the forest theme, the fairy theme, which if I'm not mistaken was a first for the Zelda franchise, and many more. If I had to criticize one aspect of this game, it would probably be the lack of painting mechanics and being able to walk on walls, that kind of stuff. 9 out of 10. Link's Awakening was the first game in the Zelda series to be on a handheld, that being the original Game Boy. Unfortunately, I've never played this game, so I'll have to review it based on what I've seen from other sources. Fortunately, it doesn't seem like I'm missing anything, because despite the new hardware, Link's Awakening is just a carbon copy of A Link to the Past. The box is the exact same, so I'm like 99% sure it's the exact same game. On one hand, it's super impressive they managed to put the entire SNES classic on the original Game Boy, but it's still just the exact same game, probably. Since it's the exact same game, probably, but this time on a handheld, I'll still go ahead and give it a slightly higher score of 9.5 out of 10. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, or Oot as I'll be calling it because it's funny, is, apparently, the greatest game ever made. It's up there with Resident Evil 4, Half-Life 2, Final Fantasy 7, Mass Effect 2, and all those other games you see when you type in greatest games ever made in the Google search bar. In all seriousness, Oot has the highest critic score on Metacritic and massive critical acclaim in general. Unfortunately, 
the game has aged about as well as something that hasn't aged very well. The game was released on the N64 over 20 years ago, so it was inevitable that its age would start to show. I'm sure at least a few of you guys have seen Aaron Hansen's sequelitis video about Oot. He brings up points about the camera, the amount of padding, and the form of the long pauses that force you to wait, and BOMB BOWLING. Since I'm a hardcore Ego Raptor and Game Grumps fan, I'm gonna have to side with Aaron and say that The Legend of Zelda Oot is a 4 out of 10 game. Great at the time, but has since aged worse than... Also, quick side note, if you want to play Oot, play the 3DS remake. Despite what some gaming journalist sites run by monkeys will tell you, it's the definitive way to play Oot. I, I mean, come on guys, better graphics, gyroscope controls, and portability! Hashtag boycott IGN. Zelda Majora's Mask actually has a very interesting development history. The game was made by Reggie Phil's AIM, who has been developing Zelda games for centuries since. You see, Miyamoto was making the next game in the Zelda series, but all of a sudden, a meteor came crashing into Nintendo's headquarters. Luckily for Nintendo, Reggie was making a ROM hack of Oot, so Nintendo stole the hack and sold it as their own. After Majora's Mask sold 4.7 billion copies, Miyamoto approached Reggie with a job offer, and Reggie accepted the offer. Anywho, Majora's Mask was the second and last N64 Zelda game made in 2000. Side note, does anybody think that it's weird that games like Majora's Mask, Hey You, Pikachu, and Conker's Bad Fur Day were released in the early 2000s? It's like, when I think of gaming in the 2000s, I think of the PS2, PS3, Xbox, GameCube, Wii, DS, Tony Hawk, Smash Bros, Halo, Pokemon, SpongeBob, Pixar, My Chemical Romance, Green Day, and Nintendogs. Not necessarily the N64. Anyway, despite the two year gap between the last two games, Majora's Mask has the same problems as Oot, most likely because of the engine. However, I will say that I like the gameplay concepts, the masks, and the darker story. I mean, I listen to My Chemical Romance, so I'm basically emo, which means I was gonna like the Majora's Mask story better to begin with, but it's still pretty good. Considering all the changes they made, I'll go ahead and give Majora's Mask a 6 out of 10. The Legend of Zelda, Oracle of Ages slash Seasons are games for the Game Boy Color, and uh, I haven't played them. The reason is because I actually don't have any friends to play with. There, I said it. I'm a loser, and I don't actually have any friends. What else do you want me to say? Anyway, for those unaware, the developers at Capcom, as strange as that might sound, took a page out of Game Freak's book and made two games that played the same for maximum profit. Unfortunately, I couldn't play these games on account of not having any friends and not wanting to play the same game twice. So, I guess if I want to rate this game, I'll have to resort to Wheel Decide. The Legend of Zelda Four Swords is yet another game I can't review because it would require that I have three friends with Game Boy Advances and I don't even have one regular friend. That being said... Okay, now we're getting into the good stuff. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, I believe, is the first game in the Zelda series that has truly aged well since La Tetsupa. I also think it's the first true modern game in the Zelda series, mostly because it had a Wii U remake that it honestly didn't really need. Anyway, to start the review, these graphics are amazing! I know way back when, people either liked or really disliked the graphical style, considering what was shown at Space World 2000, before the Wind Waker was ever announced, looked nothing like the finished product. Personally, I think the Weed Whacker has the best graphical style in the series. I don't really understand why people would prefer more realistic graphics. I mean, why would I want to look at trees in Minecraft when I could just go outside and find some trees IRL? They're basically the same thing. Anywho, I think everyone's warmed up to the cell shaded graphics of the Weed Whacker, mostly because the crybabies that demanded a more edgy looking Zelda game got what they wanted a few years later. Moving away from the graphics, this is your pretty standard Zelda adventure, but this time with a heavy emphasis on sailing the ocean. 
I'm personally all for sailing the vast ocean, unlike some people. I know that said some people think it's boring, but I don't think the trips are that long. You can get a faster sail on the HD remake, and there are more things that you can do on the ocean than just sail, like treasure hunting and filling out the map by feeding this fish guy. Not to mention sailing on the ocean blue on your way to your next dungeon in your quest to save the princess just emphasizes the sense of adventure. Yeah. If I did have to complain about one thing, it would probably be the water itself. I, I like exploring on the water, I just don't like the water. For that reason, I'm going to give The Legend of Zelda The Weed Whacker a 7.8 out of 10. Okay, so you expect me to have a GBA and a copy of the game, which is fair enough, sure, most games are like that. But also three friends with three GBAs and a GameCube. <laughs> That's funny. The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap is the top-down game for the GBA, and I honestly don't have anything to say about this game other than it's just a really good 2D Zelda game. The graphics have got to be the best of the pixelated games. The whole gimmick of shrinking down and exploring places from the perspective of an ant is cool, and executed in multiple creative ways. The only complaint I have is that I didn't really like the part of the game after the third dungeon where you have to help the little kid get his kite down from the tree. The, the whole part took way too long for my liking, and it wasn't very fun to begin with. Otherwise, I give the Minish Cap an 8 out of 10. Twilight Princess, the Wii version because it was the best version of the game and I haven't played the Wii U version, was the game that finally satisfied all the emo freaks that wanted an edgy Zelda game. And that's not even a joke, the graphics and story make me feel like I'm trapped in a hot topic at night while the mall is closed. And, okay, for those of you that don't know what malls are, they were these uh, places that you would go to shop, and there were multiple stores in the food court, so your mom could go shopping at her favorite stores while you went to GameStop with your friends, and then you could be at the food court for lunch, and make it back home in like an hour or two. They used to be the easy way to shop before Amazon.com came around. Anyway, Zelda Twilight Princess was the first Zelda game for the Wii, and it was even a launch title. You're probably thinking to yourself, EW, does that mean there are motion controls? Ech, motion controls stink! Well, Twilight Princess actually used the Wiimote's motion controls fairly well. The Borner controls are a godsend, and the sword swinging is pretty good. Some of my favorite characters are from Zelda Twilight Princess, like Agatha the Bug Lady, and that's it. Some of my favorite songs in Zelda history come from this game too, like Malamar, and that's it. TP, as I'll call it from now on because that's the same abbreviation for toilet paper and that's funny. Also had some great dungeons to explore like the ice dungeon with the cabin and the giant bowl of soup and the dungeon that with the really cool top spinny thing, spinny top thingy that's the only use for that one dungeon and it totally should have been utilized more because it's the coolest Zelda item ever, don't at me. That was, that was a good one. All in all, everything about this game is nearly perfect, so I'm giving it a 10 out of 10. So I'm just gonna go ahead and review both DS games in one go. That said, the Phantom Hourglass is ruined by the Phantom Hourglass, as in the game is ruined by the item. The Dungeon Temple thingy that you have to go in multiple times with the time limit is annoying and stress inducing. The rest of the game is fine, if a bit dated graphically, since it was trying to pull off 3D graphics on a handheld that could barely handle 3D graphics. Anyway, 6 out of 10. The Temple of the Ocean King honestly knocks this game down a couple of pegs. It's that bad. As for Spirit Tracks, it doesn't have a Temple of the Ocean King, so it has that going for itself. Not only that, but for a Zelda game disguised as a train simulator, it's pretty good. 7 out of 10. <sighs> Skyward Sword. Okay. This has got to be the most divisive Zelda game out there. People either love or hate this game. Common complaints this game gets are that it's too linear, the motion controls don't work, exploring the sky isn't nearly as fun as traveling the ocean seas in Weed Whacker, or even the fields in TP, and uh... Bye. Now, a common trend in console Zelda games is side characters that guide Link throughout the adventure. I haven't mentioned them yet because I wanted to focus exclusively on Fi because she's that annoying. Navi from Ood is kind of annoying and Minna was actually pretty cool, but Fi is the worst thing ever. 
I don't care at all about her statistics or stupid tips and tricks. I could literally figure everything out without her. And that's another thing, the issues everyone has about Fi are actually a sampling of the bigger issue, and that's the hand-holding. I do agree that the game is very bad with letting you figure things out on your own, because... Well, it doesn't. I would also agree that the sky is pretty barren. They might as well have just made a fast travel mechanic in the game, so at least I wouldn't feel like I was wasting my time with the exceptions of the very few side areas in the sky. The linearity is also a problem to me. I like open world games, and there's so much potential for open world Zelda games as we've seen before. And even after the release of Skyward Sword, hint hint. Other than all that, I think everything is pretty good. For a linear Zelda, this is a pretty good game. The graphics are great, the motion controls usually work, I'll say 95% of the time for me at least. The dungeons have always stood out to me as being surprisingly exceptional to me. I love most of them. Characters like Groose and Garham are amazing and hilarious. The game is just fun and enjoyable most of the time, at least to me. 7 out of 10. Huh. W why do I feel <laughs> so sweaty and tired all of a sudden? It's almost like I've been trudging through a metaphorical desert or something. It's almost like the desert is a metaphor for Skyward Sword, even though I didn't think it was that bad. And it's almost like I need something quote-unquote refreshing. If only there was like a symbolic refreshing glass of water to quench my thirst and- OH MY GOSH IT'S BREATH OF THE WILD! Oh wait, I still gotta talk about A Link Between Worlds, but I'll get to you. Link Between Worlds is my second favorite Zelda game. It's amazing. Some would say it's a remake or sequel to Latitipa, but I think it's a sort of Smash Ultimate situation. Link Between Worlds is Latitipa, but expanded upon, like any remake, but with enough new stuff to warrant it being its own game in the series, in my opinion. Everything amazing Latitipa did on the SNES is still here, so I won't repeat myself, but like I said, there's a lot here to talk about. Firstly, there's the presentation, which, per the usual, looks and sounds great. The new Maya Maya side quest encourages you to explore the overworld and is a great challenge to complete. Rabia's shop actually encourages you to spend your rupees, and I mean all of your rupees. You actually have a reason to upgrade your wallet and collect tons of rupees. It's like if New Super Mario Bros. 2 had a purpose. And, best of all, our prayers have been answered, and Nintendo added a painting mechanic to the game that lets you walk on walls! This is the best 2D Zelda game, best 3DS game, and one of the best Zeldas of all time. 10 out of 10. But it doesn't hold a candle to... HOLY FREAKING CHEESE BALLS! BREATH OF THE WILD IS ONE OF THE GREATEST GAMES EVER MADE! I LOVE THE WORLD, I LOVE THE PROGRESSION, I LOVE THE SHRINES, I LOVE THE GUARDIANS! Okay, now that I've had time to cool off, Zelda Breath of the Wild is the long-awaited game to precede Skyward Sword, so right off the bat, they didn't really need to try very hard to top Skyward Sword, but they did that and so much more. Remember when I said that the original game was the best open-world game for its time? Well, the, the sons of beaches at Nintendo did it again. In a time where open-world games are pretty much the most popular genre of this decade, for the first six to seven years at least, Botwa, which is what I'm going to call Breath of the Wild from now on because it sounds funny, stands out among all of them. There's so much stuff to do and explore. You know how in some games there are invisible walls that block where you can go? Well, you can go literally anywhere in Botwa. The game would probably be really boring if it was just a giant field with nothing to do, but there's so much to do in Botwa! Over 100 shrines, which are basically mini dungeons, 15 towers to climb and reveal the map, which is an idea Ubisoft basically stole from Nintendo, but anyway. And 900 Korok seeds. Side note, PSA, this is my TED talk or whatever, don't try to get all 900 Korok seeds. You, you really only need to find like 100 of them to expand your inventory. On top of that, there are side quests, towns, secret chests, guardians. Despite all this praise I'm giving the game, there are a couple of Zelda staples that they tweaked, and most people would say it's for the worse. The more noticeable omission is the lack of traditional items. Most of the standard Zelda items are still in the game, and the new runes are pretty cool, but instead of going through dungeons until you find them in a big chest, you find everything, outside of the runes and the camera, in the open world. This leads me to the other major change, which is the way they handle dungeons. 
Instead of the typical Zelda dungeons, in Botwa you get bored by these giant animal robots and instead of collecting keys and going through different rooms until you find the item and kill the boss, you explore throughout the entire Divine Beast looking for these thingies to activate. At first I was all for this new dungeon idea, but nowadays I think you spend a lot of time backtracking in the Divine Beasts. They all look the same, so they aren't even very visually interesting, and the same can even be said for the shrines. And I can even say that same thing for the bosses. They're still cool and fun to explore in, but I just hope they either improve on the Divine Beasts or return to traditional dungeons for the next few games. As far as the items go, which I kind of forgot I was supposed to talk about earlier, but uh, what are you going to do? Tons of people will tell you how much they hate how the weapons break, but I always end up having more than enough weapons at all times. I also think that the way that you get the items in the open world instead of in a dungeon is fine. I think it's pretty clear they wanted to emphasize the open world aspect of Botwa instead of it being a traditional Zelda game. Other than those major complaints, every other complaint about Botwa I'm pretty sure is pretty minor. Like the iffy voice acting and the great fairies that look a little too much like, uh... Great. Fairies. Otherwise, people have been praising Botwa for being a masterpiece of an open world game, Zelda game, and game in general and it totally deserves all the 10s out of 10 it's getting. 10s out of 10. 10 out of 10s? 10s out of 10s? Ten, I don't I don't really know. Uh, in conclusion, The Legend of Zelda is one of the worst game series ever made, and we should just go back to playing Chibi Robo Ziplash instead.